I feel like everybody needs to take inventory. Every business needs to take inventory. What is the whole story? Don't just come to a meetup of 10 photographers and everybody starts complaining about the bad economy. It's like, that's not gonna get you anywhere. You take a good inventory of your business, of the components, what's working, what's not. Um, be honest about how much time you spend. Welcome to the Photo Report, where we have conversations with amazing people, entrepreneurs, freelancers, designers, photographers. And today we have Brian Greenberg, who is the founder of Richard Photo Lab, which is a lab that I use and love. And we're going to have the conversation, so, well, not sort of, but we're going to have the conversation about just what it, what it was like starting that and then hopefully some advice to artists, freelancers, but then also especially photographers. And uh, so, Brian... So happy to have you on here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And I have a lot of my my story about Richard Photo Lab that really sticks out to me is when I first started, I made a switch to shooting film when it was, I, I went basically from, I used to shoot film and then I was strongly digital and then I basically made like the hard switch with about 60 weddings on my books to go full throttle film. And with that, I think, and then I was using Richard Photo Lab, and I think um, both Brian and Bill, who who were involved there, they're like, what? Like, who is who is this guy, and what is he doing? And so they actually, I'm down in Orange County, they're up in LA, pretty deep, and they drove all the way down from LA to come and basically say like, hey, who are you? And then also, the thing that I took away is like, we're sort of concerned that the pace that you're going. <laughs> is going to burn you out, so you need to figure something out. And which which was, I think, a very true statement, but it was for me the, the level of care that you took to drive an hour and a half probably to come and meet with me, this new guy on the field, I don't know, 10 something years ago. Yeah. But that that was like the level of customer service, like, wow, these guys actually care. And that that is, I think, the thing that really does set you apart as a lab. But that's my story and intro, but, <laughs> but I want you to give just a little bit like, what is like, what is your background and how did Richard Photo Lab start? So <clears throat> my background, I, before Richard Photo, I worked at a commercial lab for, that really served uh, uh, fine art photographers and sort of your blue collar commercial photographers, the guys that were shooting every single day, um, a lot of studio work, uh, magazine work, things like that. Fashion, for sure, a ton of fashion work. And it was, a, it was a fairly large lab, around 150 people. And I worked there for about 10 years. Before that, I was in, um, I was a photo assistant and I was going to school to be a, a photo teacher, a photography teacher. And so just sort of lining all that stuff up while living in Los Angeles. And I just went one, I went from photo assistant to like working with gear and then ended up in the lab the labs thing just sort of clicked for me. Um, a lot of technical, but also a lot of people stuff and still fashion and still, uh, it wasn't so cut and dry like equipment is. Um, and it just, it just sort of stuck with me. And so I ran that larger lab for a while. And then uh, it, it, this Richard opportunity came along um, and it just, sort, it just fit really well. It was only a that there was a, it was, Richard existed, uh, they had a, mostly clients that were uh, music related record companies and they had like 10 uh, wedding photographers. And it was this cute little thing, there was five or six people, uh, they were getting ready to close and it just seemed, it, the time in my life and everything, it just sort of fit really well to, to start something and do it a little bit differently. So uh, at the time, the way that we, the way that I really wanted to, to make it grow was to offer really great service, but not to focus just on Los Angeles, which is what most of the labs in Los Angeles would do. But who's the biggest photographer in LA? Where are all the big shoots? What studios are people shooting at? I just thought, you know, I'm gonna let those guys fight that out. Um, this service is important and there's people all over the country that need, need this service. And so it just sort of started clicking as we met people, you know, first Santa Barbara, then in Texas, and then Alabama, and then, you know, all the way to Orange County. So we kind of started feeling, you know, meeting people everywhere. And it, uh, 
and and it's we're still going. So and sorry, what year was that 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 happened? So uh, it's been 15 years that I've been running Richard, and um, uh, and then the 10 year prior for that was I was at the other lab. And was it me? When did digital start becoming a more dominant? So digital was, because I was on the commercial side before really the wedding was our main focus, um, digital was already going to put everybody out of business. So all the film companies are going to go out of business. All the labs are going to be gone. Print is going to be gone. Everything's digital. Uh, that was before. So if you say 15 years with Richard, 10 years at the prior lab, before that, it, digital was already going to destroy everything. And uh, so we were, there are the early years of my first, the first lab that I worked at, you saw it emerging uh, and it couldn't keep pace. Some people were early adopters. They would go back and forth, try and figure it out. Um, but I think it, it, as it progressed, you started to see um, you know, very large swings. Certain industries or certain parts of the industry really uh, digital fit perfectly with that. You know, so, if you think about when I, for instance, when I was going to school, newspapers were still shooting film. And so perfect, they need to be digital. They've got a fast turnaround time. Uh, when, when we did the work for the Oscars, um, still shooting film. Like they needed that that night. We'd keep the lab open all night. The editors for different magazines would be in the lab sorting out all the images. Uh, makes perfect sense. They need to be on digital. So once the digital quality caught up, a lot of different industry parts of the industry jumped on it. It totally made sense. And then what we really saw was, as people drifted away from film altogether, uh, for some people it made sense with price, and there was also just that general, you should be doing it the new way. A lot of people went that way. Uh, we started to see the labs go out of business um, all over the country, all over the world, uh, major changes with Fuji and Kodak and companies like that. Uh, Ilford goes out of business. I mean, all those things that, uh, that we would, that were long time big companies that were making big changes. Um, so what we found was that we had some very high end clients that were not buying into digital. Like, you can't talk me into this, I don't like it. And not that we were trying to, but just, you know, the, their peers are trying to talk them into it. Oh, you're gonna save money. Um, well, a lot of these folks, like yourself, super busy, 50 weddings, 150 weddings. You can't just talk that guy that's shooting 150 weddings into a digital camera uh, overnight. And um, so there were people that really stuck it out. And then through that, because we've been doing it now a while, you started to see a bit of a resurgence. And now we see film growing. and. Uh, it's kind of funny too, talking to Fuji and Kodak, um, when we tell them it's growing, up until last year, they didn't really, they, they didn't necessarily believe us. And uh, we had a meeting with one of them a couple of months ago and they were so excited, they got a bunch of labs together. And they're like, did you know film has grown this much? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we told you that like two years ago. And, but they just, it took that long for it to catch up where they saw all their film sales, all, both companies uh, just growing, which is healthy. It's good for the market. I, I wish they actually listened because both Fuji and Kodak are completely out of stock. <laughs> their main film you know, yeah. stocks, which in the middle of summer, which is the heat of the heaviest season. Yeah. So yeah, it, I mean, it's been a 15% year on year growth the last couple of years, which yeah. is, in, in both those companies, last year they were out of stock, this year, so which means with film, people <clears throat> are buying more film that they're, than they're making or right. estimating that they're gonna sell, which is, I guess, a good thing for film. And I, I can see where how difficult it is from their, their position. They have to project this out for years. They've gotta buy raw materials and minerals and all kinds of crazy stuff that we've never have heard of, you know, whatever it takes to make the film and all the chemicals. But they are taking, they do take it seriously and there's a lot of people working to, to rectify problems like the, the running out. And, um, you know, to see both of them run out at different times, uh, I hate to say it, but it's almost healthy for them because, you know, one runs out, it makes them look really bad. But so the other one's like, yay, we won. And then it's like, <laughs> oops, we run out too. Well, the other one is so it kind of evens out and there's still people making people decisions and, and they, they miss the mark sometimes. Uh, but hopefully we're, 
getting past that wave of continue, you know, worrying about running out of stock. Yeah. So as like, I'm always really interested in the business side of, I guess, business. And so as an entrepreneur and someone like, I'm going to take on this new business in this thriving industry of film, which was not thriving at the, you know, it's like, it was on the decline. Like what, what made you decide to stick a lab and like, I'm going to be like, I'm going to keep this thing going and take it over and really be just a film centric company in, in the midst of it, not being a popular decision. Right. So it definitely wasn't that forward thinking. Um, it was, it, it, it seemed like a good business to, to get into at the time. We, I had some connections. I knew some people, I knew some photographers. Uh, but when you only have five or six people, um, you're still sweeping the floors and doing everything it takes to run a small business. And about a year into it, um, a year or so, Bill, when Bill came on board, we talked about, we're gonna be the last one standing. Meaning that we recognize that everybody's going out of business. We're small, we're lean, we're hungry. We're here to give good service and we know that other people are struggling with it. So it started off with a little bit more of a negative sort of thing. It's like, this is, we're gonna ride this out because we're gonna ride it to the end. And um, being that we were a bit smaller, I think that allowed us to, to take on more clients more easily. And as people did start to fall off, um, it allowed us to grow. And, and curiously, the, the folks that are um, in the field now processing for the, in the same arena that we are, majority of them haven't, they, they, they started that business from scratch after we were already around. So when we started, we were the, the little guy out there with all these other companies that were much bigger, uh, with way more funding, and had been around longer. And now it, it, uh, there's been a, a little bit of a flip-flop on that. But as far as like the, the, to be an entrepreneur, I'd say it, and, and certainly we, we've seen this in workshops and books and things like that. It kind of is connected to how much pain can you tolerate? You know, how much risk are you willing to put in this? Um, because it's often like a very high stakes gambling, um, uh, like a high stakes gamble where you are, the, you've made yet another decision that puts everything on the line uh, at hoping that business will come and your base, uh, base costs, the buildings and people and uh, internet fees and server space and all that stuff, it just keeps growing. It's, it's very, it's pretty complicated, I'd say. Um, and it, it, it's important though. When, it, when it's important, I think, is that still drives you back to why are we gonna do this? Why are we gonna wake up early? Why are we gonna grind it? Why are we gonna argue about this thing that costs a dollar. Well, because we do like thousands of them and a dollar versus 99, you know, 95 cents might make a difference. And so you get, you have to stay hungry. It's hard. I think artists have the same thing to like, how do you stay creative? How do you stay hungry and want to do this every day? Um, so I think like everybody, we go up and down with that. But um, now I see it that I have a responsibility to the families that support the lab that are supported by the lab so we have this whole crew group of people that have been here for many years that have very special techniques and um, if I screw this up and they lose their job they don't just get to go on Craigslist and in you know in two days they have a new job it's 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 a little more difficult for some of these folks and out of respect to what they've done to keep the lab growing I look at that I take my responsibility very seriously and um, and in there somewhere is is deciding how we're going to invest in something the risk we're going to take you know hearing from the clients about what is uh, difficult for them you know we need faster delivery or we need faster this or better that or rotate one of these or clean this we have to respond it's it's not uh, it's not my way or the highway it's it's really figuring out what the clients need so Going, going to your clients now, having been involved in the photo industry for as long as you have and also knowing that you go to workshops and then you come alongside photographers because I would assume 
that your photographer's success, your customers end up being your success because as they become more successful, they're giving you more business. What, what are things that you have seen? What are the best things that you've seen photographers do for, I guess, longevity and success? And then <clears throat> the next question would be like, what are, what are the things that you see that really people need to change or like the worst things that people are doing that you wish you could come in and be like, Hey, don't, you know, yeah. don't do that one. Yeah, um, that one's that one's almost easier. The, the what Let's the worst there, part? Then. The worst yeah. part is because it's very universal, and I think we all do it. Which is, um, they they have we have trouble. I think everybody has trouble with priorities, and what I see is photographers uh, massively dedicated to improving their craft. As a literal photographer, I need to take this image better. I need to learn how to do that. And what they, what they miss and what is hard to watch is when they put incredible massive focus on improving that part of this business and they don't do anything on the business side. And so with that flips right to what are the biggest, like the most exciting things I see people do is when I see these photographers that have a major hustle going on. They know they're a good photographer, but they, and so they, they're going to work on that, but they're going to work on the hustle and make sure that they're booking and make sure the price is right. And the time is that they're doing, you know, the spending on the post-production side is right. Because what we, what I see is photographers, when you're running the solo operation, it's so easy to get, um, distracted, distracted. <laughs> it's so easy to be told what you're doing wrong. And um, uh, I think that when photographers, if they're willing to write it down and go, okay, I'm gonna work this much time on the actual business, I'm gonna work this much time on the craft, uh, they'll, they'll find better balance and they'll, they'll realize that, I, I'll, let me put it this way, I've seen uh, more amazing photographers, really incredible, amazing photographers absolutely go straight out of business because they have no business acumen, they have no business sense and it's not something that, I don't know that we're all born with it, but it's something that is readily available that can help them. And, um, and that's always what I worry about is that there's so, and there's so many places to get information about how to be a better photographer, use this lens, that filter, that, you know, this program, uh, use the, you know, bounce the light here and wait for that time of day. But it's, those are all great if you're, but if you're gonna go from being an enthusiast to be to being some or you know somebody that just loves photography as you'll always be a photographer okay that's different but if you're gonna run a business and you're and you're paying the rent feeding the kids the house the putting the gas in the car we have to balance that out and um, I would say that's sort of the two sides of where I see folks struggle and and what's up one thing I will say that's exciting is when when I get a chance to talk to people and it's like, wow, some, I have met some amazing, amazing people. Um, certainly too, what's kind of, what I like about the industry that we're in is that it is female dominated versus all this, this crazy stuff you see in the news about the, you know, the wages aren't equal and all that stuff. It's yeah. like, well, come into our world and women are kicking butt everywhere. And when you meet, when you meet them, you talk to them, you're like, yeah, it's another powerhouse. You know, they've got major hustle. They know how to build this. Um, and it's it's just exciting to see something that's, you know, not in the news and where the news is, you know, shows how, you know, the guy makes twice as much as the girl. It's like, not where I work. You know, when you see these photographers, they're, it's head to head and it's it's all based on the work. Oh, yeah. And they're killing it. I, I basically am a bridesmaid every weekend. So. <laughs> you know, in, in that industry. Yeah. But, and I, I think the thing that you were just saying before that piece was almost the example of when you and Bill drove down to meet with me because that the whole business side versus the artist side where it's like someone who's doing a major volume, it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you survive? How do you do this long term without just completely running yourself, in, you, know, yeah. you know, your nose into the ground? But I guess what, when you talk about the business side, what does that really look like for someone? If someone who doesn't, who's not doing that very well, and they're very talented, and they're an artist, and they like, kill it on the photography side, or whatever their art or craft is, what does it look like to, like, on a healthy level, run a good business? Like, does that? 
it's a vague question, but it's also like, it's very important. Where do you start? Question. Yeah, right? Where do you start with a situation like that? And what, what I would say when I, when I, when a situation like that is in front of me, um, where I really start is, you know, how much somebody makes is irrelevant to me. It, I don't care if you are looking to make 30,000 or 300,000, but tell me what you want to do. And are you happy with what's, what's happening now? So I start with just that. Are you happy? And inevitably, you know, with the, within five minutes, you can get somebody to just, to kind of come clean. It's like, well, I love the business, but you know, either I'm working too many hours or I'm not making enough um, and I need this particular thing to change. And so it's, it's, it, I feel like it's a pretty common thing bec- that it's, cause it's like all of us, just as humans, um, when you don't have somebody you're accountable to, you just either, you need to define the hunger inside to go after it. And so there's so many motivational speakers that'll help you get that going. And that's really what sort of taught me to, uh, get up and stop complaining about it and do something about it. But it's really, when I talk to photographers, that's what we're going to, that's where I start, which is, okay, how many hours do you work? Most common answer, they have no idea. So, okay, first thing, let's just do it. Let's ballpark it. Are you working, are you working six hours a day, five days a week? Oh, no way. I'm working way more. Okay. So let's run it out. If you're running, you know, let's say you're working eight hours a day, five days a week, 2,080 hours a year. Um, how much you make it? How much did you keep? Well, I kept this much. Okay, divide that many hours by this is how much you kept. There you go. There's how much you make. You know, fourteen dollars an hour. And uh, is and that, that enough? Stage, Starbucks. Starbucks sounds great with insurance well, that's paid the thing. For. Yeah, that's and that's what the question is. Are you okay with that? And the, if the answer is no, and look, it's been it's been fourteen dollars an hour. It's been ninety dollars an hour. It's been all of them. Uh, when I because I've talked to such a wide variety of people. The question is really, are you happy with it? And it does go back to what you said is like, it's almost, it's pretty easy to get it going in the beginning. The question is how long can you rent it out? And certainly the, if you talk specifically on the wedding side, um, that has got to be one of the, the best startup businesses anywhere because of the, you don't have to build anything really. You could, you could do this off of, a names from a few friends and you could book a few weddings, you know, get paid in advance and all this kind of stuff. That's not normal. You know, the businesses that are all around us had to come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars before you ever saw their name. So you can get that easy jump start, but then what are you going to do with it? And so I think it, it, it just all ties together with that person. And, and we see people, I see people be successful with every different type of background you can imagine. Medical professionals that got into this, and they figured out how to make this happen. And it, um, you see accountants, you see lawyers, you see people working at banks, and they figure out how to make this happen. And it, it's exciting to watch, but it's also scary because they, the ones that aren't gonna make it, um, and you want them to, you want everybody to make it. But the coming clean on, what is it you really want out of this? You know, if you're living in Southern California and you're supporting a family, you need to generate a lot of money. Um, and you can, you know, maybe if you're in the Midwest, you don't need to generate as much, but there aren't as many people. So we have to be realistic about how this is going to work. We have, I'll talk to somebody that, um, that they, a very common conversation where they might move, they might, or they are moving in the next two years. That's tough. Like, what do you, you have to recognize that your business can only be so successful if you're going to be a, photographer that shoots in this area and you are probably moving in the near future like how do we figure you got to work out a plan yeah and at that stage it's it's really you know are you on one level as a photographer you could be anywhere sure and travel in but yeah that's that's such a hard thing well the travel photographers have figured that out but the what i'm thinking of is the ones that aren't travel photographers that aren't destination photographers um, if you, you, someone once compared it, uh, like you're a farmer, but, and so many businesses are like that. We have to farm your piece of land, even for what I do, even though we have all these different kinds of clients. If I said, Hey, we're going to start selling t-shirts. Everybody'd be like, what? Like, well, first of all, they wouldn't say that because they would never think of me for selling t-shirts and then they would never buy them because they wouldn't, it just wouldn't click together. So 
it, when a photographer is working on that business, what, what is this thing supposed to look like? And it's, it's fun to, ch- to talk to people and to try and slice through a few of those things. Um, and I know that there's amazing, there's amazing places for them to get that information when, they, when they're willing to go out there and, and, and ask people. I'll give you one example that I've asked people that are on that, let's say on the wrong side of how much they want to make. Super talented, that, that person we're talking about. Is there anybody in your town that, um, that you think you're a better photographer, but they're making way more money? It, every time I've asked that, they almost, they really want to burst out a couple of names. I'm like, I don't need to know a name. Just if you think that you're better, but they're making more money, what are they doing that's making their business successful? And I think they, that person has just probably done a better job compartmentalizing. You know, they put their CEO hat on and say, okay, the business side has to do this. Uh, the talent requires that, and and find better balance between the, the categories of running a business. What do you think the best things like? Let's say that is the case where you've got. I basically have always described myself as like I'm, I don't feel like I am a great artist, but the business side is why I have been successful. But what do you feel like? If there are a couple of things on the business side, what are the things that that maybe the compartmentalization but like what about that would make someone more successful than the more talented person uh certainly it's it it's back to basics of of good service um i don't think that whether it's my client that is a photographer or the bride to be uh the family they want good service too they're paying a premium for what you guys do so they expect you know, uh, well-written and timely emails and a product to arrive in, in a reasonable amount of time and good prices for what it is that they're doing. Uh, and I think coming up with that whole idea of what it is that you're going to offer as a company, it's, it's a little tricky because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another to sit in front of a person that, and sell them, sell them this thing. Um, so I think that's a tricky one. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely tricky. I, I feel like it's. I think I think it works for any sort of freelance business, but relationship definitely is probably the most important thing for any sort of business. Like, if if you want any sort of referral or repeat business, right? You know, that's sort of like the farming your land. That all comes down to referral. It comes down to relationship. That comes down to. I, I always tell people is like, people refer people that they know and that they like. You know, and the only way to do that is to know people and be, have actual relationships with them versus just like networking to get a job. You know, it's like it's time and it's investing the time and it's farming the land. I, I really like that. And ap- but the, you're totally right. The, the referral, especially in the photography industry, is just so powerful. Even if you're on the artist side, it's somebody saw it and they loved it and they had a good experience with you and they just can't wait to share it. When you think about when, when each of us think about our buying experiences out in just the regular world, people love to tell like, man, I had, this was so cool. I went to this restaurant and they did this and they did, they don't write down my order. And there was 10 of us and they gave, everybody got the plate in the right spot. Like, how do they do that? And it just, when people get good service, they want to tell people about it. And, you know, I, a photographer from, from my perspective is absolutely is going to live on referrals. And so you have to, you, you have to take care of every client like that, that that's, that is your gateway to the next 20 clients. It's interesting too, to see how photographers disconnect from that. Even say, um, one that focuses on weddings, but they do port, they, let's say they do both. Um, but they never really bring together their marketing. So they, they, they work the wedding and that's it. But then the portrait, they work totally separately. And my, what I would ask is like, well, that that wedding is a family did you like convert them into a lifetime portrait client and most people don't um most people it it seems like i should i don't want to say most a large percentage of people only do one or the other they're hardcore portraits or they're hardcore wedding and they have a hard time bringing it together kind of like destinations too i think destination you know we only touched on that phrase a little bit but it is, um, I think destination, people that, that go into destination as a title for their business are involved, like their core, 
I don't know that they have played that out on the calendar. And so I would really encourage anybody that was thinking about going down that road to go, okay, this does sound great at 23 and single. Uh, what's it look like? 28 and engaged, what's 32 like with a kid with and four kids. With four kids. Um, there's, there's wonderful things because you're opening yourself up to that huge market, but you're also, you're living out of a bag. And it, if that's okay with some people, it's not okay with others. And, um, and I've seen a lot of folks, let's say, that have been really successful, the five and 10 year mark, really struggle with, well, now what am I gonna do? This was not part of the plan to be on the road for just incredible lengths of time. And uh, it's just business plan stuff, like talk to somebody about it and try and find, try and think about farther down the road. Yeah, I, th I think too many, especially, especially something like the wedding industry, but a lot of like art and creative type industries, there there is this element of like you fall into it. You know, it's like you're you're talented, and all of a sudden you start getting hired, and now you've got a now you're getting hired a lot, and now you've got a business. Right. And so, and then it's it's that's really exciting, you know. And so you are running now. Now you're booking a lot of gigs, and you've got a business, and you're able to support yourself. And now you're full time. You're you know you turned your passion into your career, but then all of a sudden now you've got a career. Right. You know, and then there's that element of I and with that whole process, I don't think enough people do what you're saying, stop and actually like plan that out. They actually forecast that. They actually look at like how do I how do I do this for a while or how am I paying my bills or how much money am I actually making? Right? Right. And I think that's all stuff that you're saying. And the word too, when you say artist, you know, it's it's a tricky word um in with the people that I work with because really if you if you charge for your services on a, and you and you've got a website and you have a business license you're really a creative for hire and an artist I mean usually the rest of the world let's say the non photographer people associate the word artist with starving artist and so we're really not it is a massively artistic business that does have true artists operating inside of this business but really when you sign up for your business license you are signing up for something slightly different and you know the artist in, in so many ways gets to do what they want but this isn't when you sign up to do a wedding this is about what they need and it's just a, it's an interesting I know the word is it's a beautiful word and it's a beautiful idea but it get just like so many things it just sort of twists and changes a little bit and people get hyper focused on the artist side and not the creator for hire and i'll tell you like that's why i to me when i talk to people it just it isn't it is at this point a natural uh way a natural way i talk that i we are here to serve that's what i say about what i do and that is what i think photographers sometimes forget like hey you're here to serve that person like they don't want that and of course we want it to be true to you as an artist but we have to find this balance and, um, and I've seen really wonderful ways that photographers do both. And, you know, there was one photographer that had, um, they used to always carry around a Holga. They're like, nobody's looking at any of this stuff. This is all me. This is just for me, the photographer, because they felt like their clients couldn't connect with it. And then later down the road, that same person, those images, I can't remember how they present, they, they showed them to, their client, I think the client may have seen it on Instagram or something like that, and they're like, oh my God, I love that. I, I need that image too. And so it, I think there's fun ways to introduce it, but it is, uh, I mean, that's the same thing like in our side of the business, there's, there's a ton of creative going on, but the bottom line is what is that, what does our client need from this? So if I think it's too warm, but the client wants it that, the, client gets the way they need it so there's a lot of tricky stuff in there finding the right client I know photographers always talk about that finding the right client but um, I think there's a lot that's a big topic you know I, I with that sentiment I actually feel like it's a detriment to feel like to believe that you're an artist like basically what you're saying because I I, I think it's a big internal struggle of feeling like you need like if I was to... Like, it's a lot of pressure. Man, I, I already put a lot of pressure on myself. And I know for years, I had this expectation on myself to constantly 
produce something better than the last thing that I produced. And when you're doing a certain amount of volume for a certain amount of years, it's really daunting to be able to do that. And at a certain point, it's like, I don't know what else I can do. And, and actually, if I was to do something really different than what like people have seen on my site or seen from my work, I think they wouldn't be happy. There's, there is a, so I think there's the balance of being able to recognize that, be like, I'm actually, this is not my avenue to be an artist. This is my job. And if I want to go be an artist and create, I can do that. Or maybe it's during, during the shoot, I, you know, Art Striver. Mm. So I, I heard him speak out at the Palm Springs Photo Expo. And one of the things that's always stuck with me from that is like, hey, listen, first of all, like uh, editorial work, that's my personal work. You know, it's like, they don't pay that much but I'm always shooting for the client. And so I get what the client wants, then I go and I take my shot. So it's one for them, then it's one for me. And half the time they end up liking that shot, but half the time that's the shot I'm using my portfolio. I'm not using what the client wanted, but I'm still giving them what they wanted. So the same deal is like you can take a job as a job and in the midst of that, you've got the shots that are all necessary, but then you can experiment and do the stuff that really resonates with you. But I I think if, if you can get over that internal voice of feeling like you have to be this artist it's a tough one because there's a there's there's your you know your personality there's ego there's so many strong things that play part of that (laughs) yeah but I'll, i'll tell you what uh why i love that what you just said about um you know i've done all these weddings how what am i gonna do next like at the next wedding and i've had that exact same conversation with people and it is this they say it exactly the same way they want something new for me and i say no they don't They saw your portfolio. They want their face, their location looking just like that. Like you got to cut yourself a little slack in that situation. You're right that they want what they saw. And and Artie Stryber's situation, that's a great one, which is, you know, if you're going to pay, you know, three hundred dollars a day to go into some cool magazine and your cost, his cost out of pocket is a few thousand dollars. It's like you're going to get what I want to shoot because nobody's making they're making the money. He's not making any money that particular day. So you can get really creative, but uh, that's a you know uh, when I talk to folks that um, have done the large volume for many many years, they in their heart they still see this as an art. It is an art. It is creative, um, but there is a, a huge element of predictability. We know what's going to happen. Um, she's gonna wake up. They want to get the shot of them getting dressed. He's gonna walk over there. They're gonna see that there's a there's a dance. There's a kiss. There's a there is a script that's going on, and that's I see people beat themselves up over it. And it's like you know it's okay. The, the client was happy, and maybe you want to go to shoot with some more creative locations and and work with a bride that's from a slightly different demo. That's cool. But people I think beat themselves up on that when they've got a good thing going. That's that's probably the piece I should add that's most important. They've got a really good thing going. And they're they're struggling with say that burnout or um, different kind of elements. I guess it all kind of boils down to burnout. So, and when I think about burnout, either for for me or my crew or the photographers that I talk to, it's it's so often not the thing you think it is that burns people out. It's you know if if a photographer could just shoot, they're probably not going to get burned out. Maybe today's wedding is a little less exciting than the one from last week. But if they didn't have to deal with all the other stuff that's bringing them down, that's, you know, too much post-production or, you know, an album that's, you know, behind schedule or a client that needs a particular thing that you can't get it as fast as they want it to. There's all the other stuff. And I feel like that you see that more, that that's really what is at the core of, of somebody struggling. In fact, finding out what it, what's at the core of any problem inside of a business, I think is always real. That's the hard part because everybody has to be honest. Like, why are you tired? Why are you not making the money you say, or you want to? Um, you know, do you? What do you want next? And does this feel great? It's like, and sure, like you, like we were saying before, it. Some somebody starts this when they're 25 years old, fresh out of art school, and now they they've got living with a ton of roommates or living at sure, home and yeah, and they're like, overhead. hey, I'm on a plane, I'm going to Hawaii again, and then all of a sudden you're 35, 40 years old three or four kids and hey this one's only that many years away from college and you're like oh my god what's going on here it's it's a it's a crazy a business itself is crazy and I think people underestimate how difficult business is in general 
And then the creative side makes it more complicated because you can't be, a creative business doesn't, you don't just get to make something and put it in a box. And so I think that's a very interesting component to it all. Because if you, if you open up a liquor store, you put stuff on the shelf, people come and they buy it. Uh, when you make something from scratch, uh, dealing with light changes and equipment failures and personalities and you know, really happy bride or really sad bride or all the crazy stuff you guys deal with, um, it makes for a really exciting business, I think. One that goes off the rails sometimes. Yes, it does. But yeah, I guess if you were to wish something on like the photography community or just like the small business community or a piece of advice that you could, you may have already given it, but what would be something that you wish people would either know or take this to heart or do? Oh man, what a question. I I think it maybe touches on some of the stuff we talked about where, I mean, I feel like everybody needs to take inventory. Every business needs to take inventory. What is the whole story? Don't just come to a meetup of 10 photographers and everybody starts complaining about the bad economy. It's like, that's not gonna get you anywhere. Um, when that was a popular topic, what I would tell those photographers is, you know, there's like two or three million weddings just in the United States. Like, how many are you trying to get? 20? So the bad economy was not your issue. It just, you weren't in the zone of shooting stuff. and. So I, I guess it really starts with, you take a good inventory of your business, of the components, what's working, what's not. Um, be honest about how much time you spend. I think a lot of people, I've had a lot of fun conversations about how much time you really work on it. And, and I asked, uh, I've asked people along the way to separate, because um, I do this too, you have to separate how much time you're actually working versus thinking about your business. And uh, I got a call from this woman, so funny. She called me back after I asked her to do that, just laughing. She's like, I'm so mad at you right now because you were so right. I spend, you know, 25 hours a week, she calculated it, 25 hours a week worrying about her business. And she spent 20 hours a week working. And so it, it, she was just laughing. She's like, that's ridiculous. I have so much to do, but I've, she, she's trapped. And when you don't have a boss, let's say, to crack the whip on you to say, do A, B, and C and do it over and over, we get lost in stuff. So I'd say it's take an inventory. What are you happy with? What are you not happy with? And then that's the thing when you're in charge, if you don't like it, you're supposed to fix it. So I guess that's the first thing that comes to mind. No, like I would say my boss is just a slave driver. He's <laughs> a jerk, never gives me any time off. And it's true. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, one of the big things it's I think there's this myth that running your own business is this dream same it's like being a destination photographer is this yeah. dream being being a success like every anything when it gets to a level is actually like it's it's pretty brutal like running your own business it's brutal having employees and having the responsibility of having employees that are dependent on you and like the success the success that you bring on and the decisions that you make that impact potentially their lives. You know, it's a, it's a lot of pressure. And a lot of times we fall into it and don't really take that into account. But I think the advice that you gave is right on and really appreciate it. And I'm sure a lot of other people appreciate it. But thank you so much for just the advice that you gave and everything that you shared. I think it's gonna be really powerful for people that maybe are just earlier in their years or hopefully even like further down their years to stop and think about where you are in your business and take your inventory and figure out where you're actually wanting to go and how you're going to get there, which I think a lot of people don't take the time to do. You sort of fall into it and just sort of go with it and yeah. then complain about where you are. <laughs> and so if you like this video, uh, this is Richard Photo Lab. Check them out. They're the lab that I use. I love. And it was just great having you on here. Thanks for having me. If you like the video, subscribe below and if you shoot film. Film Supply Club, get the best film there, and you can send it over here to get it processed. But thanks so much, and see you on the next one.